So thanks everybody for joining. I'm Dana Mastriani, the Assistant Library Director, and we're fortunate enough to have Jen Ort here, um, the foremost expert on uh, the Bullbrook site. Yes, yes, don't say no, that's not true. <laughs> Um, a little bit about um, tonight's program named Diners, Drive-Ins, and Caribou Drives, Paleo Indians at Bullbrook near Ipswich. Paleo Indian sites in Northeast are characterized by dense tool concentrations representing discrete activities that have potential, have great potential for defining a wide variety of relationships. Ongoing research in the Northeast is directed towards defining what characteristics may distinguish large social gatherings from accumulations of smaller occupations that occurred over time. The Bullbrook site located in Ipswich, Mass is one of the largest and seemingly most spatially organized paleo Indian sites in North America, inspiring investigations into large social gatherings and their function. Continuing analysis of artifact distributions combined with a reconstruction of site map reveals contrasting activity patterns between interior and exterior portions of the ring, as well as around the ring, contributing to the interpretation that the occupation represents a highly organized planned event. About Jen, Ms. Jennifer Ort's archaeological experience began in the White Mountains of New Hampshire at the New Hampshire State Conservation and, Rec and Rescue Archaeology Program, also known as SCRAP. She did that in 1996. Over the course of the past 20 plus years, she has worked in the cultural resource management sector before recently changing careers as an archaeologist working in government surface services for Horn. Ms. Ort received her MS from the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine in Orono in 2012, where her research focused on an intensive analysis of the Bullbrook One site under the guidance of Dr. Brian Robins Robinson, um, who is well known in the archaeology field and has since passed away. So I will turn this over to Jen and say thank you for joining. And um, we really appreciate everybody um, making time for this tonight. I know you have lots of things to choose from, and we're glad you chose us. So thank you. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jen. Um, and so I will I will jump right in and hopefully uh, it'll be it'll be fun for folks. So is that my sharing the right screen? Yes, perfect. OK. Um, so uh, I my talk tonight is diners, drive-ins, and caribou drives uh, dive. Excuse me, paleo Indian subsistence and settlement patterns in the Northeast U.S. Uh, perspectives from the Bullbrook site in Massachusetts. There we go. So a little bit of uh, just background um, on the landscape as it was when folks arrived here. So as we know, the Northeast experienced uh, a glaci glacial period. The glacial maximum was 24,000 years ago, as you can see on the image on the left. Uh, ice is all the way down to George's Bank in Long Island um, and points west. Uh, around 4,700 years ago, the ice has started to retreat out of southern New England. Um, it persists in northern New England. And you can see the relative sea level rise has risen um, up to Bangor, Maine is inundated. Um, and but we still have a lot of land uh, that's out of the water that is currently presently submerged. Around 13,000 years ago, the ice sheet retreated into Canada, leaving ice patches in northern Maine, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. Uh, sea levels are now about 60 meters below modern sea level. Uh, and note also that the Northeast Peninsula, or excuse me, the Northeast is a peninsula which has been created by the St. Lawrence Seaway. And then the purple circles on here, this is all from an article by John Lothrop, who is a state archaeologist in New York State. And this is a wonderful um, article that he did, uh, Paleo Indians and the Younger Dryas. Um, and so I just want to make sure that I have that there for you. But the purple circles here on his map are lithic sources that would have been available to folks as they were coming into this region. So who were the Paleo Indians? Um, here in the Northeast, we recognize them as the first people um, to come into this area, but their sites have been identified all over the North American and South American continents. Um, 
It is a cultural phenomenon that produced morphologically similar stone points that are known as fluted points, which is uh, this A point here. This is a wonderful example of a fluted point from Bull Brook. Um, it's accompanied by this highly specialized toolkit produced from crystal crystalline toolstone, which is basically just uh, material that has got a high silicate content. Um, so was that a pointer? Oh, it is. Um, I don't know how it works. Oh, what is that? Sorry, something went weird on me. I apologize. We'll try that again. I thought I had a pointer, but I, I guess I don't know how to work it. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Let's get this back where I can see it. There we go. Um, so yeah, so the, again, so these pieces that are examples in D and G, C, H, and F, these are all considered highly uh, cryptocrystalline charts. Um, and that means that they have a high nap ability. They're easily controlled when you're removing material. Um, they are easy to rejuvenate. So if it breaks, you can turn it to something else quite quickly, um, which means that it's really transportable. So these folks are moving long distance. So they have a, a stone that uh, can go with them and doesn't just kind of fall apart after the first use. Uh, Paleo Indians were considered highly mobile because of this tool stone um, that was coming from sources in Northern Maine, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and the Hudson Valley, um, and often comprised the lithic assemblage at any given site, suggesting a mobility range of almost 1,000 uh, square kilometers. And a well-established belief for this mobility is, as I was saying, that they required this really high quality tool stone. Um, and it's believed that this procurement is embedded uh, with a subsistence economy that's focused on migrating caribou. I don't know what that is. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, as I was telling uh, Diane, my PowerPoint completely um, disappeared on me and crashed. So I kind of had to cobble this together uh, in 20 minutes. So I do apologize for the errors. Um, so anyway, getting back to the Gulf of Maine and the light Pleistocene, during the Younger Dryas, vegetational regimes are pushed south. So this, and this is when folks are coming into this area. That's at 13,000 year ago time period. It's basically a return to near uh, um, glacial conditions. It gets very cold. Uh, the modern analog for this time period would be the Quebec Labrador region during the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, so during this time, we have two large, what is happening with this? I'm so sorry. During this time, two large long distance migrating caribou herds existed and had a migratory range of over 1000 kilometers. Smaller herds of more locally migrating mountain and forest caribou, which are subspecies, were also supported by this environment and were along the southern margins of the larger herds migratory route. Now, hunter gatherers have been utilizing communal hunting strategies since before Neanderthals emerged. And there are numerous ethnographic examples as well. Evidence of paleo Indian communal hunting has been identified all over the American Southwest by large kill sites consisting of hundreds of animal bones at the base of cliffs, et cetera. Um, structural evidence of corrals, hunting blinds, more recently, a complex hunting structure was identified under Lake Huron and dated to about 9,000 years ago. And calcine caribou bone has been identified at many Paleo-Indian sites in the region, albeit most are small and fragmentary. So we know caribou was an important resource for Paleo-Indians. We just don't know what to what extent or what other subsistence economies were practiced. And this is because organic materials just don't preserve in our acidic soils and temperate climate unless they're burned or found in a shell midden or some other extenuating circumstance that halts the decay process. A majority of prehistoric sites in the Northeast are therefore only represented by the inorganic materials that we recover, being the stone tools or the burned organics bone because of this preservation problem. So Paleo-Indian sites are typically characterized by these dense tool concentrations. Um, they may be related to activity patterning. They can be an important measure of site size, organization, duration of stay. The problem then with these large sites in which multiple loci are present is in distinguishing between locations that may rep 
represent multiple occupations so people coming back every season say um, over a long period of time um, and or those just used once so it's it's just they're difficult to really tease out the difference between what we're looking at Ethnographically, aggregations of hunter-gatherer bands have been shown to differ according to duration, location, season, activities taking place, and group size. And here we have two examples um, of the Kung in Africa, and then this is um, a group in India, it's just showing different patterns of how people organize themselves in a landscape. And activity patterning is not rare in the Northeast. Um, many Paleo Indian sites have reported similar. Um, patterning. Um, and I have just put on the Brian Dean Jones site, which is recent in the past several years, as well as a tenant swamp site in New Hampshire. Um, so recent excavations at the tenant swamp site uh, yielded a radiocarbon date of 12,570 and 12,660 years. And the patterning within the low side, this is a very well excavated site. Um, they worked seven days a week uh, for seven weeks on this project. Um, and what we have here is basically one of the best uh, ideas of what an internal patterning on one of these low side might look like. Um, we also, again, I said the Brian D. Jones site was really very recently discovered in Connecticut. And that's a multi-component site that dated to 12,500 years ago. So not only is it the oldest dated occupied site in Connecticut, it's also the only site in the American Northeast with well-defined stratified early Paleo-Indian deposits. So the Bulbrook sites. Uh, these sites are uh, in Ipswich, Massachusetts. They're located on a relatively flat landform that's approximately 40 meters above the modern sea level. The well-known Bullbrook site is a large circular site that's comprised of 36 discrete loci and measures about three acres in size. The smaller Bullbrook II site is about 300 meters southwest and is comprised of seven tightly clustered loci in a linear pattern. Today, the site is surrounded by a Holocene salt marsh that was created likely around 4,000 to 2,000 years ago. The sites, uh, were discovered in 1950. And I cannot talk about Bull Brook without talking about the absolute heroic efforts of the avocational archeologists that excavated um, for about 12 years at both sites. So initially the land was acquired for sand and gravel removal in 1949. And the stripping of topsoil began shortly after. I should note that um, the landform had been used at least since the 1600s as farmland. Um, and that's about the extent of disturbance prior to the sand and gravel operation taking over. So the property itself had already been known for years to have artifacts, but folks had only ever recovered uh, later archaic and woodland period materials because they were basically working within the tilled soil of the farm. And it was on November 1950 that Joe Vaccaro found uh, the first fluted point in a recently bulldozed area. The sites were excavated between 1951 and 1962 by the principal excavators, uh, William Eldridge, the four Vaccaro brothers, Joe, Nick, Frank, and Tony, Tony Orsini, and Billy DiPaolo. Um, I also had slides in there in my, in my original version of um, Doug Byers and Doug Jordan. Doug Jordan, of course, got his PhD through Harvard in 1960, um, working on the site, and Doug Byers uh, was his dissertation advisor. Uh, even after the excavations were complete, the group continued to meet for some 30 years at Nick's house in a shed he built, um, and they called it the Paleo Club. Nick became an exceptional flint napper, and Bill, who was the principal record keeper, ended up working for the Peabody Essex Museum and convinced the group to donate their Bullbrook artifacts to the museum where the bulk of the collection remains today. And so when I went uh, to start my master's research, I spent uh, between 2005 and 2007, many, 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 many days in the basement of the Peabody Essex cataloging the over 50,000 artifacts that were donated uh, by the um, Bulberg excavators. And Bill, who is here on the right of the image, um, would come and visit me quite often and would always just wonder about the mystery of the fluted point. And I cherish those days. Um, 
So getting to the research that I conducted, um, the uh, work that I did in the cataloging was then to basically run numbers. It was a lot of um, statistics and Excel spreadsheet fun time. Um, and what happened was that with Bullbrook One, we identified concentr concentrically organized activities uh, where the interior loci were dominated by biface production. So that's things like your projectile points. Um, bifaces can also just be bifacially worked tools with sharp edges that can be used for any number of things. Um, and then we also have in drills are another. So the drills and flake shavers can be bifacial and they, um, they can be used for woodworking or uh, anything you can think of a drill would be used for really. Um, and flake shavers. Uh, and then we also had scrapers and gravers. Sorry, I can hear my children upstairs, so I'm getting sidetracked. <laughs> uh, these tool distributions show that point manufacturer activities dominated the interior while processing activities dominated the exterior. Channel flakes, which are the waste products from making the fluted points, um, comprised about 84% of the interior. And considering the interior is only 26% of the entire ring, it's 15 times more flute flakes in the interior than the exterior. And so these activity patterns we felt were related to the use of the site as a communal gathering that's believed to be centered around a hunt for caribou. Um, visually, we can see these distributions through the use of Golden uh, Software Surfer program. And the distributions here are showing interior counts versus exterior counts, where the open contours represent the exterior loci and the color ramped uh, contours are interior loci. So we have channel flakes on the left. Um, I should note the contour interval for that is two. So every contour interval as it goes up adds two. And then uh, the end scrapers are on the left and they have a contour interval of five. So Obviously, there were a lot more end scrapers. I think they were the most dominant tool form at the site. Um, but these patterns are very compelling because we see not only a dominance of those end scrapers on the exterior, uh, where channel flakes are really that locus 34 is just um, something's going on there. But what's also interesting when you look at this is that 30, locus 34 and locus 15, something is going on there that's drastically different than just an interior and exterior pattern. So considering the sharp reversal, uh, the content of the six loci was contrasted with the remaining 30 loci, confirming the significant negative occurrence of gravers and wedges in the biface dominant loci. Um, reverse the inquiry to find what the actual distributions of biface group dominated and end scraper dominated loci by simply ordering the two groups by decreasing percentages of end scrapers. And it yielded this rather strong and sudden reversal that is associated with the six loci dominated by bifaces. Um, the Western half of the ring then appears quite different from the remaining loci. So that's that locus 15 again. Um, prior to any analysis, I think it was midnight, Brian and I were in the office and just decided that we were going to separate uh, the ring into quadrants. And we're just looking for natural breaks between um, dots and that created uh, the A, B, C, and D. Um, we also looked at the types of material that were at the site, and we had thought that perhaps the distribution would contrast around the ring, and it would represent basically different groups coming from different parts of the Northeast, um, arriving at Bullbrook from, from these locations. Uh, and so although only four of the sources we confidently identified, so it did certainly shrink down the amount that we could look at, we did compare the proportions against the remaining unidentified materials. And the other category that we created um, is quite possibly Hudson Valley chert, but it's just, we couldn't really say that with confidence. Um, so proportionally, the materials are not a strong pattern as we saw with the tool forms and really just looked evenly distributed um, around the ring. However, we had this quadrant A and C where they were different from each other, where Jasper, which is coming from Pennsylvania, was significantly overrepresented while quadrant A, I'm sorry, in quadrant A, while in quadrant C, the other, which is probably again New York, was overrepresented. 
So looking, thinking back to our ethnographic examples, we have an example of the Gwich'in here. This is a subarctic Canadian group. Um, and this suggests that large aggregations would have had a group leader from which the other groups would gather around. So if Bullbrook represents a gathering for a communal hunt, a leader may be expected to coordinate hunting activities. The spatial analysis at Bullbrook does not allow us to refine the relationships and to kinship patterns, but the new evidence of asymmetry may be associated with some sort of leadership. If hunting preparations were clustered around the leader's camp, then the distribution of biface manufacture clustered in the southeastern and eastern portion of the ring may reflect these relationships. This in turn brings focus on what was apparently the largest and most interior concentration, Locus 15, which contrasts with the other interior loci and may be related to gender roles at Bullbrook. Now, uh, Bullbrook 2 is the smaller site, as I'd mentioned earlier, that was about 300 meters to the southwest. And it's temporally related. That means that the tool forms that we found, as well as the lithic material, were all um, as if identical to that what, which is found at Bullbrook 1. However, it was not probably not occupied at the same time. And we think that just because of the, the formation of the loci and how they're arranged. So the site was located along a boundary fence line. Uh, the loci were unevenly distributed in about a five by 35 meter area. It lacked the tool diversity that we had at Bullbrook 1 with the exception of Locus A, uh, which resembles the biface dominated interior loci at Bullbrook 1. So overall, Bullbrook 2 looks like your typical Paleo-Indian site that we would find. So what, what were they doing there? Why were they at Bullbrook? So during the site's occupation, sea level was some 60 meters below modern sea levels. And presently, the sites are located within about a mile of the coastline. And at the time, they would have been almost 12 miles away. Uh, the study strongly supports the communal hunt theory for Bulbrook 1, but for Bulbrook 1 to represent a large aggregation, a substantial food source or the promise of one must have been present. Caribou, one of the primary resources exploited by Paleo-Indians, has been identified within the Bulbrook collection, and the now submerged topographic feature known as Jeffrey's Ledge may have supported a caribou refugia, and this is basically where caribou go. Uh, spring, summertime, they have their calves, they get really fat on grasses before they um, migrate in the wintertime and go into kind of smaller groups. So it's, it's literally a refuge. Um, suggesting the site was situated as a highly predictable intercept point as the caribou came to shore for their winter dispersals. Additionally, whether to support a large aggregation or the smaller occupations represented at Bulbrook II, other resources must have been present for exploitation. Since the creation of the present day salt marsh occurred through Holocene sea level rise after 4,000 years ago, their take, um, the surrounding environs were likely woodland or meadowland. These environments could have supported smaller fauna, including freshwater shellfish and drought and anadromous and catadromous fish, migratory birds, small game, as well as floral resources that could have been used for both subsistence and for raw material acquisition. The convenient juxtaposition of two diverse settlement types provides an essential focus of comparison between different scales of occupation. Portions of Bulwark II may still be extant, and the land was actually uh, recently donated by the landowners, uh, the Connollys, graciously donated it to the Archaeological Conservancy, so that is actually now protected, and that's fantastic. Um, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> so these methods were designed to further our understanding of the spatial patterning of discrete loci that make Bulbrook seemingly unique, uh, while also contributing significant new information pertaining to aggregation patterns. There is a lot of work left at Bullbrook. Um, the collection is housed at the Peabody Essex Museum, although I think it was moved to the library, and um, Bullbrook too, certainly, uh, as well. Um, I have barely scratched the surface of this site, but I think that uh, the work that Brian and I did hopefully shed light on what these large sites look like and what we can expect them to look like, and perhaps what uh, we can expect in patterning. And that's, that's it. Thank you, Jen. Um, <laughs> Again, I apologize that uh, I, I, my 
I lost the original, so I apologize for all of the technical difficulties in the middle there. Not, not an issue. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions that people might have. Yeah, absolutely. Joan, you're muted. So if you're talking, you're muted. I can talk. No. There we go. <laughs> um, I was just, can you go over again, you know, kind of the definition of a, the, a paleo Indian and is it, you know, I didn't understand a lot of what you were talking I'm about. I'm so sorry. But, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just the science of it, you know, yeah. is, is new. So, but so they were basically here, but tracking caribou. Um, and uh, these were, you know, central sites where they would gather at certain points. Is there evidence that they actually maintained year round housing? Can you surmise that from your work? Um, no. And I think so. Basically, what the Palo Indians are the, the first folks that come into the region after the ice has left. Um, okay. And the Palo Indian as a whole, the period lasts from around that, uh, you know, 13,000 up until about 9,000 years ago. Um, they're highly mobile. Uh, so campsites are often, um, they look like bull brick too. So you'll just have a couple loci. Um, there are larger sites. Of course, we have the Israel River complex of northern New Hampshire. Uh, the Potter site, um, sites out in uh, Lake Eudora and Park Hill, where I, these activity patternings have been identified. As far as long-term stays, um, I mean, we can assume these probably were, you know, maybe a couple months as they're okay. hunting the caribou, they're processing the caribou, you know, all these things take time. You've got to kind of like um, met out the meat and the, the sinew and the cartilage and the bones and all the things that you're going to get from the caribou, the hides to the different groups. And then I'm sure people are also making and creating their uh, exchanging information and news. There's probably, um, you know, uh, mate exchanges happening, you know, all these kind of things that are gonna occur. So we can assume it was probably a couple months, but I would, without actual evidence, like it's been, and that comes down to that lack of organics that we just yeah. don't have, um, if we have a hearth, then there's a good chance we can find burned seeds. Um, if you can find charcoal, there are uh, folks that will identify the wood and they can then identify the season, the growing seed, you know, all this kind of great stuff, if you have it. Yeah. And oftentimes we don't. And what, and what happens is that our soils are so acidic, it breaks organics down quite quickly. Um, so it's really difficult to find that stuff. And, and it has been identified at sites. And there's a uh, Shawnee Minisink down in Pennsylvania, I think it was one of the first paleo sites that had actual like food stuff. So we, you know, could see that they were eating more than just caribou. Cause that's like literally the only thing we ever find because when it's burned, the bone becomes calcined. Okay. And so it actually preserves and the burning preserves um, the organic. So without that burning, we, we don't have it. Wow. It's, it's just amazing, really, what, what yeah. you discovered. Well, it's, it's funny. I always tell folks, like, when you when we do archaeology, when we go to these sites, um, it's the, and through time and people collecting, uh, by the time we get there, it's the equivalent of going to the library and taking out a book and finding that every um, every fifth page has been removed, or you have one out of every five pages, say. Yeah, so you're only getting a part of the story. And so we're trying to um, piece together how these people lived by looking at every time there's a new site that's identified, people like get all excited because we're hoping that we can just add a little bit more to what we know about these folks. So. I don't know if that answers. Well, Sorry, I go on well, tangent. Thank you. I no, apologize. No, no. Bring me back in if I do. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think somebody had asked in the chat yes. if the site was, no. So the site, um, Bulbrook one was uh, destroyed by the gravel pit operation. And in fact, while the guys were excavating, the, the cool thing about it was the family that bought the gravel pit knew the Vaccaros. They had all grown up together in Beverly. And so um, because they had this relationship and uh, the, the Bulbrook boys and themselves were already, they were collecting 
in fields and stuff like that. So they were they were a known quantity um, as well. Um, so when they heard the gravel pit was starting, they asked if they could come and just kind of like look around and see what they could see. Because again, it had always been known to have stuff out there. They just weren't expecting to find uh, what they found. And so um, they had worked out this kind of deal where the, the gravel operation wouldn't come and dig until they had kind of like cleared it. And so the guys would go in and they would start to dig. And if they found something, they would start to dig out and they would dig and continue to dig until they stopped finding stuff. So the negative spaces between the low site and the center of the ring, all that negative space we know is negative space because of how they excavated the site. And then once they had kind of cleared it, the gravel folks would come in behind them and then, you know, essentially take it out. So there's nothing left of Bulberg one. I've been out there relatively recently and yeah, it's gone. <laughs> Um, but Bulwark II, the, um, that was on the fence line. That is, I would say, about 98% destroyed. But again, the land, uh, it's, it's still private land, um, part of it. But there was a part that was owned by another family that owned it while the guys were digging. And um, they, knew, they knew her. Her son uh, recently donated it to the Conservancy. And so they, they protect and conserve it, I think for like a hundred years. So it's now protected, which is fantastic news. So. Can I jump in and ask a question about the, the digging and what have yeah. you, um, knowing that it's just sort of appeared and it was happenstance. Did um, the fellows, uh, that whole group of those paleo guys, did they actually use regular everyday archaeological excavation practices so that when we got these um, fluted points that we we could put them into some sort of context or did they just come to you and say here's a shoe box full of things essentially they came in cigar boxes um which i have i have one here on my desk that's hiding behind all the things um but this this is one of the bullbrook cigar boxes um, and that was essentially how uh, this stuff came in so we one of the things that we don't have which was so great about the tenant swap site is we don't have the horizontal other than the locus itself and the size of the locus and how they you know they would find something and kind of like radiate out from it until they found nothing that's about all we have for context control so we don't know within that circle where artifacts we were found and the only um, evidence we have of the depth was just in talking with Bill, um, who had said that, you know, they would dig and they would find all the kind of younger stuff, so the archaic and the woodland period, which is the, the later kind of um, iterations of, of native groups in the region, um, would be up high. And then they'd have about like a 20, 20 centimeter gap of like finding nothing. And then they would start finding the, the Paleo-Indian stuff. So that's that's literally all I have for context um, because, but at the same time, you know, we, they were excavating in a manner that um, Arctic archeologists were excavating at the time in the fifties. So it's not like they weren't just kind of, they didn't have a plan, um, but there's, so there's certainly things that were missing, but the amount of work that they did do, the notes they took, the photographs they took, Brian Robinson, recreated uh, the ring and the spatial patterning and the size of it literally by going through photograph by photograph, identifying trees. Here it is in this picture, here it is in this picture. I know the focal point of the camera. I know where they were standing, taking measurements. I mean, I'd come in to the office at like eight o'clock at night and he would have stereoscope glasses and wow. be looking at pictures, trying to line up trees um, he had all these complex measurements like uh, Doug Jordan and I think um, Nick Vaccaro had both taken panoramics on a video camera. So Brian like tracked down the make, the model, the focal point, all these things to determine where landmarks were because they had named the loci according to landmarks. It was Doug Jordan that gave them the numerical numbers. Prior to that, it was like the lone pile, the pine tree, um, the lunch spot, <laughs> Joe's bones. I mean, Frank's bones, sorry, it was like Frank's bones. Um, just, you know, how we actually name a lot of sites today. You're like, oh, 
I'm near a dead tree. It's the dead tree site. Like we're not very creative when we, when we name things. So it was um, essentially stuff like that. And so Brian was trying to identify, okay, well, where was the big pine? Where was the lone pile? And it took him several years to really, it wasn't, I mean, he was just about done with it by the time I came into the program and um, had really nailed down what the ring was. And it was about a, a 60% scale error, I believe, uh, between what Doug Jordan had published and what, what it actually turned out to be. So it really was a heroic effort of all those guys involved that really anything that Brian and I have done since could not have been done without the amount of work that they did and put into it. I mean, they were out there on weekends, they were out there on vacations. You know, I was looking through pictures earlier today of, of uh, Bill and I think um, Joe, and it's like, you're looking at excavation photos and then a vacation photo, a beach photo. They had a lobster lobster party of, who is it? Joe was the lobsterman, I think. And like, so they had, there's like pictures in someone's basement and they're having a big, you know, lobster boil. And so it just really like humanizes the whole thing. If, you know, um, these were, this is just what they like to do. It was what they did on the weekends and they spent 12 years working mm -hmm. at those sites and preserving them. And, um, and then, you know, thanks to Bill's efforts in the eighties, getting them to all donate it to the museum. So, uh, Sorry, big shout out. I, I have a lot of respect for that. So I can apologize if I go on a tangent. No, it's a great hearing all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate it. Other questions? I get a couple of others seeing that nobody yeah. else is jumping in. Um, can you go back to the slide um, that describes the situation that you were talking about, the um, the relationship of the people potentially at that group? Um, uh, I don't think yeah. I understand what what was getting conveyed in that slide. Um, the one with the Gwich'in? Yes, I yeah. think that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, if you bring it up, I'll be able to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, again, I have too many, too many monitors. No worries. Um, what screen is it? This one. Okay, what I wanted to get to that one. Come on, go up this one. Can you see Can it? Re-explain uh, what you were saying here, because I think I got lost. Yeah, no, of course. Um, so the the graphic on the left is from uh, Slobodin, who was an ethnographic anthropologist um, and studied this group in, in subarctic Canada. So it would be kind of the most uh, um, contemporaneous, but uh, equivalent, I guess, a modern analog to uh, Paleo-Indians and how they might, um, you know, live on a landscape. And so, one of the things that we were looking at what fascinated about this, and I think when Brian and I first originally were looking at it, we were looking at those circles four and thinking like, oh, that could be Bullbrook too. Like, oh, they're off to the side, you know? Um, but really it comes down to this, this organization of how uh, they're grouped around the campfire. Um, in this sense, this would be one locus certainly, which again, we I don't have this level of detail. We just have the locus themselves, not not within the locus, but it still implies that, um, you know, when they get together for large aggregations, someone's going to be in charge. You're going to go and try to take out a thousand plus, 10,000 plus head of caribou. Someone's got to know what they're doing. Um, so there's going to be some kind of leadership. It might not be one person, it might be several. And so we thought maybe that we were seeing by, so we had this really clear interior exterior. We've got uh, bi-face manufacturing happening in the interior that's the making of the fluted points, et cetera. Um, and then we have kind of the more utilitarian processes occurring on the exterior. So you're hide scraping, um, whatnot uh, with the end scrapers and other, other scraping tools. But then we had those two, um, if you remember the locus 15 and 34, um, where the, so the locus 34 would be the one that's all the way on the right in the interior that had all the channel flakes in it. 
And then Locust 15, which is in the black ring, had all the end scrapers. So those looked vastly different to just this kind of black and white interior exterior. And so what we thought was that perhaps this had some patterning as to how not only are we, we having just activities being separated by interior and exterior, but also perhaps this indicates that there's whomever is in charge, like they're all kind of hanging out there and getting their tools ready, right? They're, they're essentially sharpening their knives and uh, getting ready to go and hunt these, um, these caribou. And the other thing to think of too, is that this would have been a group effort as a whole. So not only do you, I, we think what they were trying to do is basically corral the caribou as they're coming off Jeffrey's Ledge and corral them that 12 miles into Bull Brook. And you would need everybody on deck for that. So the women, the children, the elderly, everybody's gonna be out and the, the um, you might have folks at higher elevations that are kind of making sounds and banging things to scare the caribou. And so you're basically leading them to where you want them to be. And then the kill site could potentially be closer to the site itself. Cause I, I like to think of it as like, when you go to the grocery store, you're not gonna park, you know, eight miles away and then drag your groceries to your car. You're gonna to try to get as close to your car as you can. So I'm assuming they're gonna to wanna to do the same with 10,000 caribou and kind of drive them towards the site. And all of that needs to be organized and somebody has to, or several people have to kind of lead that to ensure that it goes off um, well. And so we thought maybe, so looking at this kind of modern analog of the Gwich'in and how they had organized around a leader, was that something that we could perhaps say about the organization at Bull Brook? Again, we don't have the um, amount of detail to really tease out all of that. It was just one of those kind of compelling things to be like, huh, I don't know, could be, maybe. Um, and just something to think about you know, when we look at other sites as they're excavated today, like Tenant Swamp and the Brian D. Jones site, um, I don't think they looked at this stuff per se, but those certainly have the context control that would help address these kind of questions or answer them, perhaps. Thank you. That gives me a much richer understanding yeah, of what. Sure. <laughs> so we're trying to use a modern analog and superimpose it and see if mm -hmm. it fits, if the data suggests that it's a similar thing. Right. And that the earlier ethnographic examples were a similar kind of look at, okay, well, how do hunter gatherers today organize themselves on a landscape? And it depends on what they're doing. You know, is it a seasonal camp? Is it just a family nuclear camp? Or are they coming together to do something as a group that the whole group is needed to accomplish? Yeah, understood. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, are you saying that, you know, when they got together like this, that they were killing up to... 10,000 caribou? I mean, I don't think, I mean, they I mean, probably weren't killing the whole herd, but, you know, depending on how many people would have been there, you know, you'd, you'd want to get enough to take care of everyone. You've got to get yeah. your, your hides for the winter. Caribou fur has, is a unique, um, the fur itself has a hole in it, like each individual hair. And that apparently is ideal for warmth, like the, the way the caribou fur is, is, um, and so that just, it's ideal for like everything, hides, tents, clothing. Um, and then of course, all the other parts, the meat, the sinew, the bone, uh, the fat, everything. So, I, I mean, you won't, you don't want to like burn your whole grocery store down yeah. in one, one go, but yeah, yeah. you know, you want to get enough to get you through the winter or until you come across your smaller herd. Yeah. Um, Do you have any idea, you know, um, about how many people gathered in these spaces? I mean, is there ever any evidence that would point you in that direction? Um, I mean, if we're assuming, and this again, assume is a, it's a big word yeah. and we use it a lot because we, we really just don't know, but going on the idea that like, it's probably nuclear family or extended nuclear family um, and each individual band uh, coming together. And I think too, the other thing is that the, 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 the thing that always kind of blows my mind about Bull Brook is that it had to have been known about and whether that's what Bull Brook too served as a kind of scout point of like, 
Somebody came there the year before and was like, I found the best spot for next year's hunt. Because you've got to think that these things were happening. Bullbrook cannot be the only one. It's just the only one we have found. Yeah. And I suspect a lot of that is because it's under Boston. It's under Providence. It's under a very thickly settled, highly developed region of North America that we probably just don't know anymore because they're gone. You know, they're under 95. <laughs> <probably. Yeah. laughs> but as far as numbers, like, yeah, I don't, I, I think you can assume an extended nuclear group, maybe for each locus. I mean, they're about seven meters in diameter, 15 meters in diameter. So yeah, you're not going to get, you'll get like a handful of people in those. Hmm. But I've never run crunch numbers to figure out counts. Okay. Great questions. Other people with questions. I'll jump in. Um, can you go back to the slide that had the um, the fluted points? Um, um, yeah, it was pretty early on. I yeah, think. yeah. I'm just trying to figure if it's faster to just get out of it and go to it. Yeah. yeah. So those artifacts uh, to me look like there's a lot of intact material there in terms of yeah those those are all complete so i should probably explain what each one of these are that might help so right. yeah. i only pointed out a and that is of course our our classic fluted point um uh if, i wonder if i can figure out the pointer how does this work laser pointer if you just move your mouse over it, I think that would work. Oh, there help? you go. There yeah. you go. Yeah. All right. So right here, we can see this beautiful uh, channel that's running up the center of the point. There'd be another one on the opposite side. Um, the other thing is we have this little notch here on the left. That's probably the haft element. So that's where it would have been hafted to um, a spear point. Hmm. Uh, and these are, uh, there's characteristics. You can actually see there's the other one here on the right side. Um, and it's believed that, that that flute is literally just as a hafting element, so it sits on the spear. Um, up here, this uh, F, this is a uh, flake shaver. So I like to think of these as woodworking tools. Um, there are a lot of these in the collection, and some of them had these kind of flat backs, some of them were ridge backed. And my dad was a woodworker, so I always like to think of them as like your, your heavy handed chisels and your, your finer chisels, you know, your finer woodworking tools. Um, but we believe that's what these would have been used for. Uh, this is just a giant biface. And so this is probably how material is being transported because a biface is literally your Swiss Army knife. You can use it for just about everything. Um, and you can transport material with it, and then you can knock flakes off and make other things with it, eventually turn it into a fluted point. When the fluted point breaks, um, there's a lot of end scrapers that are made on the basis of fluted points, because once it broke, they would just, you know, which is, this is an end scraper here, this D. We call this the jade scraper because it's so pretty, um, but we see a lot of Broken fluted points that have been rejuvenated into end scrapers, and this would have been your, your hide scraper, although these are smaller, so these would probably be, again, your more finer work. We've got uh, big side scrapers that look like this as well, that are probably for your kind of heavier initial removing of, of things. Um, this here, this is a graver. This is made from jasper that's from Pennsylvania that's been burned, which is why it's red. And it's this little point here. So there, we think those are like all, so like a little piercing tool if you're making holes in clothing or um, decorating uh, a bone or wood implement. Um, this here, C, is what we call a wedge or PSSGA. Uh, and these are just splitters. It's, it's literally like a wedge that you would use today. And so they're battered, um, sometimes all four sides, usually uh, the two sides from this kind of bipolar, like, you stuck it in something and then you're hammering the other side to split, you know, maybe a, a bone to get into cartilage. Um, these are the twist drills here. Uh, and they have this distinctive S twist on the end. And some of my favorite photographs was Bill Eldridge would take his own drill bits and compare them to these. And they were identical in that S twist. So the drill itself has not changed <laughs> in 13,000 years. Um, and then down here, B, these are two examples of channel flakes. So these are very distinctive types of flakes. 
Uh, this, is, this is essentially what's removed to create this channel on the point. And when we find these out of sight, we know we're like, oh, yep, yeah, okay, paleo, we know where we're at. So the, they're very identifiable um, types of flakes. And these are both, this one's broken. Uh, this one looks complete, um, but they're, they're very identifiable artifacts. So those are, those are the most identifiable artifacts that we had at the site. These, these are all the groups that we used for the analysis. So a couple of questions. Um, thank you for explaining all those. Yeah, of course. Um, the fact that they are intact, can we make any inferences other than it's not been disturbed, greatly disturbed? Um, yeah, these were at these were at depth. So these, um, from again what had Bill had explained. Say so we had um, on the top layer. So about the upper twenty centimeters. And I apologize, I'm bad with imperial measurements because archaeology is all done in metric. But the upper twenty centimeters would have been your your plow zone. So that would have been the the part of the landscape that had been continuously plowed from the 1600s up until it was purchased by the sand and gravel pit. So that that level of disturbance up there only goes about 20 centimeters deep. And that's where they are finding all, again, all the kind of earlier native stuff is kind of intermixed in that plow zone with historic artifacts. And then he had said that they, um, they would get a gap, they would get a negative um, levels where they were finding no artifacts as they went down and then they would find stuff oh. at depth. So uh, it, it implies then that the materials were protected, not only from modern or sorry, historic use of the landscape for farming, um, but you know, really the only way it was found was because of that gravel pit. So it would have been not deeply buried like the Brian Jones site, but certainly um, at depth. And that's just time. Um, it's also would have, that landform itself was, uh, I believe a Delta, um, like a, it's a classic Gilbert Delta. So it's, it's water lane deposits. Uh, it's relatively medium coarse sand. So they may have been higher up in the soil horizon, but they over time over, you know, 12,000 years, they've kind of shifted and drifted down every time it frosts, every time a worm moves through, every time a tree grows a root, it's shifting grains of soil and sand around and it's moving things down. You know, in the, when folks, I'm from Rhode Island and when first folks, historically for settled there, the uh, colonists would joke that the only thing they farmed were rocks because every year they'd come up to the surface. So it's, things are moving up and down by just natural um, processes. So it's probably one of those things where it's, you know, it's been buried over time as soil develops, but it's also being shifting. So there's a lot of different interactions occurring. And it was, so it was just lucky that they were, <laughs> it was undisturbed for that long. And lucky that those guys knew to go out and look and lucky that they um, were avid avocationalists who had been new. I mean, I think what Bill had said when they were out there, both the Clovis and the Folsom site had only been discovered about 30 years before they found Bull Brook. So it was still a really new um, time period that hadn't really been known about, but they, they knew, I mean, they were reading the materials, so they knew about those sites. And so they knew as soon as they saw that fluted point, they knew what they had. Um, and I believe it was 1954, they published the first article in the uh, Mass Archaeological Society Bulletin. Hmm. How do we know that this site wasn't just a site for them to get ready for the um, uh, the uh, the killing of the the animals, knowing that there's um, distinct areas where there's lots of flaking and, and retooling. So, you know, how, how do we know that it wasn't a place where th this is a tool manufacturing site? Mm -hmm. um, I think just because of the, the nature of Paleodian sites in themselves, they're so, um, uh, like they're rare. When you find them, they're, they're small, um, it's usually you can you can hold the amount of artifacts in your hands that signifies a Paleo Indian site, um, or they're just like one locus. So these larger sites are extremely rare, and so um, that in itself, just the the size, the amount of artifacts that were recovered, um, it, it implies that this is more than just uh, like we're just going to prep for a hunt. And then I think too, like if the surmising, I have no evidence based on it. I'm just making assumptions that the kill site is going to be nearby. 
then you might just be, you, you're going to hang out after the fact too, and just kind of, you know, maybe prep for winter because we, we think that it would have been a fall hunt because you're, you want to get those caribou after they've fattened themselves up for the summer. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been out there eating grasses all summer long. So you want to get them as they're coming in because that's when they're going to be the healthiest and the fattest. <laughs> Um, and that's where you're going to, that's when you want them. So we, we think that they were there in the fall. It's possible they stayed through the winter. Again, we don't, we just don't have the seasonality data to make those kind of, um, decisions about longevity of stay or whatnot, but we can, I think, make some educated guesses that it was, a, a they were there prepping for the hunt and they were there after the hunt and then where they went after. We don't know. The material that you said that came from Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. um, has that actually had a, like a geochemical analysis so that they know with certainty that that's where it's from and compared it to that in Pennsylvania or is it just, it looks like Pennsylvania. So they- It looks like Pennsylvania and um, the, let's see if this will, there we go. The, um, one of the, uh, one of my committee members was a lithic, uh, specialist. Um, and so he was the one that actually, it was like he and Brian and I that went down, um, one winter weekend to look at this stuff and, and went through to confidently identify, okay, this is, this is a marker of Pennsylvania Jasper. So that would be this orange. Oh, I lost my marker. This orange material here is, is, um, classic Pennsylvania Jasper. It's got the, uh, ooids in it. Um, it's got a lot of, oh, it's been so long since my brain had to think about lithic things, but it's, it's, it's got all the hallmarks of, of the Jasper. Um, this is the uh, Monsungan chert that comes from Northern Maine. Um, this is also Monsungan chert. So you can see there's even variations within a single source. Uh, same thing here. This is Hudson Valley chert. Uh, the emerald, uh, the jade scraper is also from the Hudson Valley. Um, so again, variation within a source. Um, we have local uh, Massachusetts rhyolites um, here and here. And then we believe this is uh, New Hampshire rhyolite. Mm -hmm. um, so each one of these has very uh, identifiable characteristics that we can say with certainty that these are coming from such and such a site. And uh, but these are, again, these are done through, we didn't do any geochemical analyses. It was literally, we had a comparative collection and we that said, okay, we know that these pieces are from here. So anything that looks like this, we can attribute to that source. Got it. Um, Thank you. It's yeah. amazing how much work you've done, plus the people before you as those educational <laughs> archaeologists. I got really excited about Redalarian when I got into the, the Minsungan chert particularly has really fascinating, which are just the little fossils. So like chert is a sedimentary yeah. um, rock essentially. And it has these little fossils and you can see them um, with a like a, just a jeweler's loop. And I got really, really into that. Excited about that, yeah. <laughs> Other questions since I've been monopolizing. I think I'm putting people to sleep. So <laughs> no, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Um, well, I could go on for ages, um, but I'm also respectful of your time and everybody else's. But um, this has been absolutely fascinating. And to think it's right in our backyard or was in our backyard. Um, and much like you think, what if those fellows hadn't gone out digging oh. and doing what they were doing? And if they weren't as enthusiastic as they were if it were an average person they probably would have said oh what the heck right yeah. and let the um let the um gravel pit um just go but um this has been phenomenal and okay. i for one are very um thankful for tonight's meeting and thanking you yeah no I, it was my pleasure and i i believe um i know andover museum has uh, materials on display um, and I, I think the Peabody Essex did a display. I'm just not sure where it is, but I know Karen Kramer had put something together. Um, so I, they, they are, there are some of the pieces are available to see in a museum setting, um, Andover for sure. Yeah. Good to know.
Well, thank you, everybody. Special thanks to you, Jen, for making our evenings tonight. And I will wish everybody a nice warm evening. And um, um, thank you so much. Look for the recording on our YouTube channel within the next week or so. Again, tipping my hat to you. Thank you so much, Jen, and good night to my everybody. My pleasure. Thanks, you. Thanks everyone, thank for you. coming. Good night now. Good night.